um, in a moment of madness, probably, a couple of years back, I, I thought, I sat down and I actually listed a few, actually I came up with nine uh, elements common to these very, very divergent and exceedingly different, even sometimes incommensurable cultures that, whose life ways are so strange and even alien to each other, and yet these, I think, curious commonalities. Mm. I mean, it's such generalizations are always um, dangerous, right? And they're prone to be misheard, misinterpreted. But if we rigorously remember that they, any, any such common elements, express themselves differently, very differently, for each specific people, then maybe, you know, we can dare to list a few of these qualities endemic to the oral frame of mind. One, oral awareness is intensely local in its orientation. Without the many communication technologies spawned by the printed word, I mean, without the ability such media that we now use have to bring us into contact with far off places, as books do, and now computers, well, indigenous oral awareness is much more deeply informed by the immediate surrounding locale than most of us modern folks can even imagine. In the absence of intervening technologies, our senses, co-evolved for millions of years with the textures, colors, and sounds of surrounding nature, spontaneously couple themselves to shapes and dynamic patterns in the living landscape tracking those patterns as they metamorphose through the seasons. The leafing time of the local trees, the rhythms of bud and blossom and fruit, the reticence of various animals in certain months and their antic exuberance in others, all of these unfoldings in the immediate environs provide a set of sensuous metaphors for the complex pulse of our own emotions and a basic template for our cogitations. The human animal is a creature of imagination, to be sure, but our imagination is first provoked and infused by the earthly place where we dwell, or by the wider terrain wherein we circulate. Indigenous oral intelligence is place-based intelligence, an awareness infused by the local terrain. Hmm. Two, the simple act of perception is experienced as an interchange between oneself and that which one perceives, as a meeting, a participation, a communion, communication or even communion between beings, because each thing that we sense is assumed to be sensitive in its own right able to feel and respond to the other beings around it, and often to us. Third, each perceived presence is felt to have its own dynamism, its own pulse, its own active agency in the world. Each thing, each phenomenon, has the ability to affect and influence the space around it and the other beings in its vicinity. Every perceived thing, in other words, is felt to be animate, <laughs> to be at least potentially alive. Death, then, is more a transformation than a state. A dying organism becomes part of the wider life that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. As the hollowed out trunk of a fallen tree feeds back into the broader metabolism of the forest. There is thus no clear divide between that which is animate and that which is inanimate. Rather, to the oral awareness, everything is animate. Everything moves. It's just that some things, like this wall, 
or the ground move a lot slower than other things like crows or crickets. There are only these different speeds and styles of movement, these divergent rhythms and rates of pulsation, these many different ways of being alive. The surrounding world, then, is experienced less as a collection of objects than as a communion or community of active agents or subjects. Indeed, every human community would seem to be nested within a wider, more than human community of beings. Fourth, the ability of each thing or entity to influence the space around it may be viewed as the expressive power of that being. All things, in this sense, are potentially expressive. All things speak. They have the power of meaningful speech. Most, of course, don't speak in words. But this is also true of us. I mean, when we're really speaking, our own verbal eloquence is but one form of human expression among many others, because our body itself, in its silence, is expressive. The body itself speaks. Fifth, since our own sensitive and sensuous bodies are entirely a part of the world that enfolds us, the world we perceive, I mean, since we are carnally embedded within this sensuous field, then we can experience things only from our own limited angle and place among them. And so we have only a partial view of each entity or situation that we encounter. There's no aspect of this world that can be fathomed or figured out by us in its entirety. That is to say, there are always aspects that are hidden from view, dimensions that we can't perceive directly. The depth of the world, then, or indeed of any part of the world, any piece of the world, is therefore inexhaustible. Every certainty Every instance of clear knowledge is necessarily surrounded, then, by a horizon of uncertainty shading into mystery. Sixth, to an oral culture, the world is experienced as story, right? I mean, oral cultures are cultures of story, storytelling cultures. For us, we want to know something, we go look it up. Find the right book, look, oh, now we Google it. And find it on our screen. But without Google, without screens, without books, where is all this information? How is it carried and passed on? Well, it's, it's in stories. It lives in stories. Maybe that's why we call them stories, because all this stuff is stored there in the town. To an oral culture, the world is articulated as story. The surrounding cosmos is not experienced as a set of fixed and finished facts, but as a story in which we, along with the moon gliding in and out of the clouds and the trout leaping for a fly, are all participant in this tale. Because the relation of a tale, of a story, to its characters is much the same as the relation of this earthly cosmos to its inhabitants. Just as there is an interiority to the perceived world around us, not only when we're inside a building like this and we feel like we're inside, but stepping out of this building, out under the sky, we look up and there's that thick sort of terrain or topology of cloud, that topography of, of overcast today and the ground underfoot. And here we are between the layers. But if the clouds weren't there, we'd look up and there'd be that, that dome with various lights twinkling upon it. To our unaided animal senses, the world, the perceived world, has this kind of interiority in which we find ourselves. And just as there is that 
felt sense of being inside something carnally enfolded as we are by the round expanse of the terrain around us and the curving vault of the sky. So the characters in a well-told tale live and breathe within the voluminous interiority of the story itself. In other words, we find ourselves situated in the land with its transformations and its cycles of change, much as protagonists are situated in a story. To a deeply oral culture, the earthly world is felt as a huge, ever unfolding story in which we, along with the other animals and plants and landforms, are all characters. Seven, in such a breathing cosmos, Time is not a rectilinear movement from a distant past to a wholly different future. Rather, time has an enveloping roundness, like the encircling horizon. It is a mystery, time. It's a mystery marked by the slide of the, of the sun into the ground every evening and its rebirth every dawn and by the incessant cycling of the moon and the round dance of the seasons, the curvature of time is here inseparable from the apparent curvature of space, and indeed both remain rooted in the round primacy of place. For each place has its particular pulse. Each realm has its rhythms, its unique ways of sprouting and unfurling, and giving birth to itself again and again, as the world itself turns and returns, and as, indeed, the best stories are told over and over again. A. A world made of story is an earth <coughs> permeated by dreams, a terrain filled with imagination, but this is not so much our imagination, not our imagination, but rather the world's imagination in which our own actions are participant as players within an expansive, ever unfolding story. Our lives are embedded within a psyche that is not primarily ours. The dreamy emotional atmosphere that permeates a story is much like the fluid atmosphere that enfolds our breathing bodies with its storms and its calms. Awareness here is inseparable from the air, from this invisible medium infused with sunlight which circulates both within and all around us, binding our life together with that of the tempest and the swaying pine trees. <coughs> So mind is not experienced as an exclusively human property, much less as a private possession that resides inside one's head. While there may indeed be an interior quality to the mind, we feel like we're being inward when we turn to reflect. Yes, there is something interior about the mind, but this interiority derives not from a belief that the mind is located within us, but rather from a felt sense that we are located within it, bodily immersed in an awareness that is not ours, but is rather the Earth's. And ninth, each entity participates in this enveloping awareness from its own angle and orientation, according to the proclivities of its own flesh. We inhale the awakened atmosphere through our skin or our flaring nostrils or the stomata in our leaves, circulating it within ourselves, lending something of our unique chemistry to this collective medium as we exhale. Each of us thus animated by the wider intelligence, even as we tweak and transform that intelligence. The rooted beings among us twist and flex in the invisible surge, 
Other creatures are carried aloft by the whirling currents. The denser life of rock may seem impervious to those winds, and yet the creviced contours of the mountains have been carved over eons by the creativity of wind and weather, as those mountains now carve the wind in turn, coaxing spores out of the breeze and conjuring clouds out of the fathomless blue. The wild mind of this planet blows through us all, ensconced as we are in the depths of this elusive medium. However, although it's our common element, every one of us experiences it differently. No two bodies or beings ever inhabit this big awareness from precisely the same angle or with the same sensory organization and style. Since our body, this body is precisely our interface and exchange with the field of awareness, well, a praying mantis's experience of mind is as weirdly different from my experience of mind as its spindly body is different from mine. And the dreaming of an aspen grove is as different from both mine and the mantises as its own fleshly interchange with the medium is different from ours. It is our bodies that participate in awareness. And hence, no one can feel, much less know, precisely how this big mystery reveals itself to another. Mm. Here's another way this might be said. Each of us, by our actions, is composing our part of the story in concert with the other bodies or beings around us. But since we are situated within the story, dreaming our way through its voluminous depths, according to the unique ways of our own flesh. No one of us can discern precisely how this story can best be articulated by another. No human individual can fathom just how the encompassing imagination is experienced by any other person, much less by a turtle or a thundercloud or by a car door patiently rusting at the junkyard. It's viridian paint flaking off in the desert heat. Our carnal immersion in the depths of the big mystery is thus what ensures an inherent and inescapable pluralism. Yeah, inescapable pluralism. And yet, and yet, although there's no single way to tell it, it is the same tale that is unfurling itself through our gazillion and one gestures. It remains the same earth whose life-giving breath we all inhabit, the very same mystery that we each experience from our own place within its depths. Hmm. <laughs>